Good evening, everyone. My name is David Myers, and I'm the new president and CEO of the Center for Jewish History. Thank you. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's very interesting uh, lecture and discussion. Um, I should say that I, well, first of all, I marvel that we're beginning at 6.36, only six minutes uh, late. Um, by, by LA standards, that's uh, unusual. Um, I am used to coming to this place as an historian, as someone who makes use of the archives. And for those of us who have had the privilege of using the archives of the Center for Jewish History, I can tell you that this is one of the most treasured institutions in our orbit. Now, I'm a representative, in fact, employee of the center uh, as of uh, July 1. Um, and it's also a delight and pleasure because I have the opportunity to promote the importance of history and historical knowledge to a wide public, which I regard as an important, even almost sacred task. And I think all the more so with Jewish history, which offers up so many important lessons about the passage of a small minority people throughout history, uh, a lesson from which we can learn much about migration waves, immigrants, and refugees in today's world. This is a place where we learn about Jewish history. This is home to one of the world's great repositories of archival sources in the field of Jewish history. And it is so because we are privileged to have as our member partners five great institutions, which are YIVO, the Leo Beck Institute, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, hold your applause until the end if you don't mind, <laughs> and the Yeshiva University Museum. The holdings of these member partners constitutes, the holdings constitute really one of the great repositories of Jewish archival sources in the world. And that is what makes this place such a wonderful source of attraction to scholars, professional, professional and otherwise, from around the world. I especially want to call attention to the Yeshiva University Museum, which I regard as the exhibiting wing of the Center for Jewish History. It was really YUM, as we call it, Yeshiva University Museum, uh, and its director, Dr. Jacob Weiss, uh, as well as uh, the efforts of my esteemed predecessor as president of the Center for Jewish History, Joel Levy. It was really Joel and Jacob who forged the connection with Corpus Christi College of the University of Oxford. Together, they have enabled us to host the extraordinary exhibit, 500 Years of Treasures from Oxford, which is a collection of Hebrew and other manuscripts from the Corpus Christi collection. Now, some of you, maybe all of you, have had a chance to see the treasures in the collection. There is a certain irony, I have to say, in the fact that Yeshiva University Museum, the Center for Jewish History, and Corpus Christi College are joining forces to show these treasured manuscripts. Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, is of course associated with the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation and the rite of the Eucharist, featuring the wafer and the wine as the blood, uh, as the body and, and blood of Christ. Now, Jews in the Middle Ages had a very complicated relationship to this rite. Uh, among other reasons, they were often accused, falsely, of puncturing the wafer. And according to the accounts we had, at which point blood would spurt out as a way of inflicting bodily damage on the Christian God. And the effects of this accusation could be violent and even murder murderous, uh, as for example we know in the infamous Lisbon Massacre of 1506. So this is just one way in which Jews and Corpus Christi have a vexed relationship. And yet what we also know 
and indeed what we are compelled to recall um, when we look at the manuscripts that, uh, that anchor this uh, really remarkable exhibition is that in addition to that overt level of hostility and enmity, Jews and Christians had a very nuanced relationship. Uh, they engaged in a kind of unarticulated conversation, an exchange of cultural values back and forth, oftentimes without verbal expression. Uh, and that exchange of cultural values is reflected in the very culture of the book that Jews and Christians shared, in the reverence for the uh, manuscript which they shared, uh, and which is so compellingly presented uh, in our exhibition. Uh, Jews and Christians, and this is reflected as well in the exhibition, shared the commentarial tradition, the tradition of providing glosses and interpretations on treasured texts. Jews and Christians shared a love for the Hebrew language. And certain, cer many Jews and certain Christians, uh, Christians who learned from Jews uh, how to read Hebrew and make use of it in uh, their own scriptural tradition. Uh, so these are some of the ways in which the relationship between Jews and Christians, Jews and Corpus Christi, uh, can and were quite complicated. Needless to say, we live in a different era today when we can study these phenomena, and especially the exchange of values, with a mix of empathy and critical distance, which I regard really as the balance that all historians sh should seek to strike between empathy and understanding one's historical uh, objects and critical distance uh, that allows you to offer measured judgment. Our time is also an era when Jews and Christians can regard each other not only as mortal, mortal theological enemies, but as collaborators in the work of chronicling the rich cultural expressions of that medieval dialogue. And it's really in that context that I think of our burgeoning partnership with Corpus Christi. We are not representatives per se of Judaism and Christianity. We are students of those faith traditions. And together we have found and forged a new spirit of partnership and collaboration around the study of Jewish-Christian relations. I think it really bodes well for the future, and I look forward to building upon this transatlantic relationship with Corpus Christi College. Um, before I offer some thanks to those who made uh, this evening possible, I do want to encourage all of you in this room to become more involved in the life of the Center for Jewish History, which is, as I said, um, for practicing historians, a kind of mecca, if I can mix my religious metaphors. Um, but also for those of you who are not practicing historians, an extraordinary resource. Uh, so I invite you to become involved in the work of the center in the most obvious ways um, and in less obvious ways. And if in most obvious ways, we actually do have cards that you can fill out to uh, express your support for the center. Um, and in the less obvious ways, please make sure to contact me and talk to me uh, at the reception following this evening's program. Um, but I'd like to thank just some of those uh, who have helped to make this uh, evening possible, beginning with my colleagues here in the building, uh, Joe Levy, uh, Christopher Barthel, our Director of Academic, uh, of Academic Programming, and uh, Dr. J Jacob Weiss of the Yeshiva University Museum. I'd also like to thank our friends and colleagues from uh, Corpus Christi, uh, immediate past president of the college, Richard Carradine, and current president, Steve Cowley. Uh, I'd like to thank Nick Thorne, the development director of Corpus Christi College, and those who are responsible for shaping the contours of this evening's program, uh, Professor Mark Smith, chair of the Oxford Faculty of Oriental Studies, who uh, made it possible for Professor Jan Houston to be with us, Michael Cunningham, Executive Director of the University of Oxford North American Office, and Michael Cooper, Senior Development Executive of the University of Oxford's North American Office.
And now, and finally for me, until the end of the program, I'd like to invite Mr. Jonathan Kagan, a Corpus Christi alumnus, to say a few words of introduction about the college. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, welcome you on behalf of the Corpus Christi College, Oxford, together with our colleagues at the Center for Jewish History, Yeshiva University Museum, and the Oxford North American Office, we are delighted to offer this evening's event. Before we proceed, I hope you will indulge me a little as I tell you about Corpus Christi College, one of the 38 self-governing colleges at the modern University of Oxford. In March, Corpus celebrated its 500th anniversary. This was a celebration not simply of longevity, but of something more powerful, its special place in the story of higher learning. In fact, well, as those of you on the tour heard, Corpus is not the oldest Oxford college by any means. It was the first true Renaissance institution in Oxford, where it pioneered humanism, a radical departure in intellectual life. Notwithstanding its name, uh, Corpus Christi, it is, and, and it was and is, a, a secular college. Its founder, Bishop Richard Fox, a chief advisor to Henry VII and Henry VIII, used his considerable wealth to secure a great educational legacy. When he established the college, he installed John Clayman, a committed humanist, as its first president. Together, they fostered ambitious standards of scholarly inquiry across a range of then revolutionary subjects, medicine, mathematics, astronomy, and no less significantly, Greek and Hebrew. The college became an unsurpassed center of classical and scriptural study, thanks in part to its remarkable library, much of which you, you can see on view. Among other achievements, it took the lead in the enterprise that resulted in the King James Bible. For it was John Reynolds, the seventh president, who proposed to the king that there be an authorized translation, which used the Corpus Hebrew manuscripts that are here on view. The corpus treasures are being displayed to the general public really for the first time. They are normally kept in a vault invisible to the world and with difficult access even for scholars. Um, they deserve better. Erasmus in 1519, uh, looking at the corpus library, declared that the spectacle of that trilingual library will draw to Oxford in the future more people than were once attracted to the sites of Rome. I think, unfortunately, we have to say that he wasn't quite right. Um, but that is really why we have mounted this show in partnership with our colleagues, not simply to celebrate these works of genius and the role of Hebrew and Jewish learning in the foundation of the college, but to let you know about our campaign to build a permanent home for them, one that will exhibit and digitize and store these texts in conditions ensuring their survival and actually allowing them to be studied the world over. If uh, anyone wants to know more about our plans, I'm happy to talk to you at the reception hereafter. Let me now uh, thank the sponsors of the exhibition, uh, the David Berg Foundation, Mr. Mark Cabelli, the Roger and Susan Hertog Charitable Fund, the Height Foundation, the Kirsch Foundation, Monticello Associates, and Mr. Bruce Sloven. But having now told you a bit about the history of Hebrew scholarship at Oxford, I think it's only right that we talk about what's going on in Hebrew scholarship today at Oxford. And let me turn it over now to Michael Cunningham, the head of the Oxford office in New York. Thank you, Jonathan. It's always nice to be introduced by a loyal Oxonian. Um, I'm so delighted to be here this evening. I've had the honor and privilege of representing Oxford University in the United States for almost 25 years. And I particularly like events such as these where we partner with other great institutions. And at the risk of sounding immodest, uh, we are Oxford. We do get to pick uh, uh, pretty closely and pretty carefully when we partner with different institutions. And, and so what do, what do we look for? And, and it really boils down to one simple thing. It's excellence. We look for excellence in all of the partnerships we form, uh, and certainly the, the, the Jewish uh, Museum, the Jew Center for Jewish uh, History is, uh, is very much part of that uh, tradition of excellence, that dedication to excellence, uh, and that outreach that is very much part of the modern Oxford. By forming these partnerships, we show we are not an insular institution. We are reaching out, we are embracing the world, and we're looking for partners to help us in all aspects of what we do. 
And so I'm particularly delighted to be here this evening. I must confess I was a little bit doubtful, an event in August in New York. I thought, hmm, uh, what will the turnout be like? But uh, it's a testament to all of you that you're here and that your intellectual curiosity and your devotion to this subject brings you here this evening. And certainly uh, I applaud you for being here and thank you for, uh, for your attendance this evening. Uh, I won't thank everyone who's already been thanked, but again, just to echo our, uh, our deep appreciation for the partnership that's been formed this evening in allowing us, both Corpus Christi College and the University of Oxford, to tell this story. The story begins 500 years ago, the University of Oxford's long and distinguished connection to the study of Hebrew and Jewish studies. Some 500 years ago, the university amassed one of the great collections of Hebrew manuscripts, printed books, making it an especially valuable repository for the study of a medieval European Jewish civilization. Those collections are based in the world-renowned Bodleian Library, but are also scattered around other parts of Oxford, most notably the Leopold Muller Memorial Library in our world-class center for Hebrew and Jewish studies. It's also based, of course, in some of our colleges, most notably Corpus Christi, whose treasures are on exhibit here this evening. And I must say, we are delighted with the inst installation of these uh, treasures and uh, very grateful to uh, our partners in putting, putting together this world-class exhibition. Today, Oxford offers a range of academic studies relative, relevant to tonight's discussion, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels, from classical Hebrew language and Hebrew, the study of the Hebrew Bible, through to ancient, medieval, early modern, and modern Jewish history, uh, its culture, and also society. Students come to Oxford from all around the world to study Jewish and Hebrew studies. Uh, Jewish studies focuses on the history of the religion, culture, and uh, modern aspects of the Jewish people from biblical to modern times, while Hebrew studies focuses more on the language itself, the literature, the culture, and the history of written and spoken Hebrew. Our students go on to teach and to pursue graduate, additional graduate work both at Oxford and at leading institutions around the world. And they also go on to hold some of the most important academic chairs in the field of Jewish and Hebrew studies. I should say a little bit about the Regis Professorship of Hebrew, which is one of the oldest academic chairs in the world, established by King Henry VIII in 1546. Since its inception, it has been linked to Christ Church College at Oxford, one of our most distinguished colleges. The Regis Professor is also part of the Faculty of Oriental Studies and the Humanities Division, and has links to other parts of the university, again, most notably the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies. Over these centuries, the Regis Chair has helped to attract to the university one of the, some of the best academics working in this field. And this tradition continues today. Henry VIII established a post at a time when there was a historical imperative for incisive study of the Bible, studying directly connected to the Hebrew language. And it a post that remains relevant today as it did in 1546. So our format for this evening, we will hear from our guest, uh, guest of honor, uh, a lecture um, uh, in a lecture format. Uh, and then immediately after the lecture, there will be a discussion and then we will open the floor to questions. We are very fortunate to have the leader of that question and answer, um, uh, the leader of the question and answer session, another distinguished scholar in the field, Professor Gary Rensberg. Professor Rensberg is a professor of biblical studies and Hebrew language and ancient Judaism at Rutgers University. He's held the rank of distinguished professor and since 2004 has served as the Blanche and Irving Lorry Chair of Jewish History at Rutgers, where he also holds position in the Department of Jewish Studies and the Department of History. He's widely published and highly regarded in his field and his research interests cover the literature of the Bible, the history of ancient Israel, the historical development of the Hebrew language, the relationship between ancient Egypt and ancient Israel, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and medieval Hebrew manuscripts. He teaches and lectures on Jewish history and religion with special focus on the development of Judaism in the post-biblical period. Happily, he's a frequent visitor to Oxford and has served uh, as a visiting scholar at our Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, not once, not twice, but four times, uh, and is always welcome back. And you, of course, will be hearing from him a bit later in the program as he conducts our question and answer program. Our featured speaker is Professor Jan Jutzen, again, the Regis Professor of Hebrew at the University of Oxford. He is a pioneering scholar in the field. 
Professor Yudson studied theology and semantic languages at Bel in Belgium, in the United States, and in Israel. He has taught biblical languages and Old Testament studies at the University of Strasbourg for over 20 years before, becoming to Oxford, before coming to Oxford in 2014. In bringing Professor Yudson to Oxford, the Faculty of Oriental Studies was particularly interested in his research portfolio. His insightful investigation of textual variants, his exacting study of Hebrew grammar and syntax, and his groundbreaking use of linguistic criteria to date portions of the Hebrew Bible. Tonight, Professor Yudson will address the important and intriguing question, is Hebrew a holy language? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Jan Yudsen. Uh, thank you, Michael, for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. Um, so I would also like to start by thanking some people um, from my point of view. The initiative for this evening was uh, taken by uh, Michael uh, Cooper, who is here, um, creating uh, the opportunity for this event, which uh, I think is, uh, at least for me, a very, very nice uh, opportunity. I would also like to uh, thank again uh, Christopher Bartel for uh, taking care of all the practical uh, things. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Gary Rensberg, who was mentioned before, who is a good friend, and who will um, interrogate me, grill me a bit uh, <laughs> at the end of, uh, of, my, uh, of my presentation. Uh, I'm also thankful to the three first, uh, first three speakers of this evening. I feel uh, very intimidated, uh, but um, also encouraged. And uh, finally, I would like to thank all of you for coming uh, this evening, listening to this, uh, to this talk. Uh, some of it will be a bit um, technical. Uh, I will speak about my own research, and so some of it will maybe be lost on you, but uh, or I'll try not too much. But uh, I hope, what I would hope is that you get the gist of it, that you, you see which, where I want to get to. So the title, as you know, is uh, How Did Hebrew Become a Holy Language? Can, can you all hear me like this? Because I'm tall and, and yeah? Okay, thanks. There can be no doubt that Hebrew has been regarded as a holy language by Jews and Christians since time immemorial and is still so regarded by many. But is it? Does Hebrew differ from other languages, not just in the purpose to which it has been set, but intrinsically in its inner workings? Semitists, specialists of Semitic languages, will mostly deny this. To them, Hebrew is a normal human language. Biblical scholars might add it's a human language which rather by accident came to serve as a vessel for revelation. In the present lecture, I would like to argue a different view. Although Hebrew did not start out as a holy tongue, over time it really did become one. As a language of scripture, Hebrew comes with a heavy baggage of mystique. Although the Bible itself says very little about it, later tradition, both Jewish and Christian, regarded Hebrew as the language of God himself, the language of creation, and the language of all humanity before the confusion occasioned at the Tower of Babel. Rabbinic Midrash found proof of this within the Bible itself. According to Genesis 2, verse 23, Adam said when God had created the woman from his rib, you know the scene, God brings him Eve, and he says, this now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It actually sounds fine in English, but it doesn't work well in most languages of the world. In Greek, for instance, gune, woman, does not rhyme with aner, man. And in Latin, mulier, woman, has nothing in common with vir, man. 
But in Hebrew, the play on words is perfect. She shall be called Isha, woman, because she was taken from Ish, man. There you have it. Adam must have spoken Hebrew when he said this. <laughs> and God must have been speaking Hebrew with him. In different variations, the idea that Hebrew was the primordial language mysteriously surviving among the, the descendants of Abraham was adopted by most Jewish and Christian authorities from antiquity through the Middle Ages. Lone voices of dissent existed. Gregory of Nyssa, a church father of the fourth century, dismissed the notion that God spoke Hebrew at creation as literalistic nonsense. Nachmanides, or in Hebrew Ramban, a Hebrew scholar and commentator of the Bible of the 12th century, 12th and 13th century, Nachmanides in a comment on the Genesis 45 verse 12 argued that Hebrew was a Canaanite dialect which the children of Israel adopted after settling in the land. But the dissenters remained isolated and had little impact. Even in the modern period, most scholars continued until the middle of the 18th century or so to accept the idea that Hebrew had been the original language of all humankind. If Hebrew is of divine origin, one expects it to be completely different from other languages. More expressive, more precise, and more truthful. Confirmation that Hebrew did in fact differ from other languages was found again in the creation account. When God created the animals, he brought them to Adam, and the Bible says he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Genesis 2 verse 19. Surely, the exegetes of the Bible reasons, surely God knew the names of the animals before Adam pronounced them. It follows then that Adam did not name the animals arbitrarily, but gave them the names they really had in God's language, in Hebrew. Eusebius of Caesarea, <clears throat> another fourth century um, church father, blending this intelligence with Plato's teaching in his Kratilus, concluded that Moses, in using the Hebrew language, and I quote, had arranged the names of all things about him in exact accordance with their nature. Right? In Hebrew, you call a cow para, because it is really a para. Right? It's, this is the right word for it. <laughs> Similar sentiments are found not only with authors who, like Eusebius, had little or no Hebrew, but also with authors who were intimately familiar with this language. Today, views of the Hebrew language have changed for various reasons. An obvious one is that Hebrew is again, and has been for almost 70 years, a national language. In the state of Israel, Hebrew is used not only to study the Bible, but also to buy ice cream. Glida, to discuss football. This is the European football that you actually play with your foot, right? Not, not the American. Football, Kadur Regal, and to curse local politicians. The phenomenon of modern Hebrew relativizes the notion that Hebrew is a sacred language. But long before the creation of the State of Israel, long before the resurrection of Hebrew as a spoken language, the notion that Hebrew was a holy tongue had come to be discredited among specialists. In the 18th century, even before a little bit, but especially in the 18th century, advanced research on comparative Semitics showed not only that Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic were closely related, this had been known since the 9th century at least, but also that Arabic retains many features that are more archaic than their equivalent in Hebrew. Arabic retains several consonants that have gone lost in Hebrew. So this shows that 
in, on the relative scale, Arabic is in certain features older than Hebrew. Arabic has a case system that is preserved only in residual forms in Hebrew. Such, such observations make it difficult to suppose that Hebrew was the original language. Concurrently, historical research showed that the people of Israel emerged relatively late on the scene, thousands of years after other civilization, civilizations, such as those of Egypt or Mesopotamia. In all logic, Israel's language, too, belongs to this later period. To cap it all, Wilhelm Gesenius, very great biblical scholar of the beginning of the 19th century, Gesenius showed how the Hebrew language changed over the biblical period, manifesting more archaic traits in earlier texts and more modern elements in later texts. Gesenius concluded that Hebrew is not a divine language, eternal and immutable, but a human idiom obeying the general laws of linguistics and adapting to socio-cultural and political influences through time. Taken globally, it is fair to say that the study of ancient Hebrew over the last 300, 300 years or so has moved away slowly but surely from the idea that Hebrew is a holy tongue. In the non-academic world, one can still find ideas expressed, and I quote a recent book, that at a, this is the quotation, at a metaphysical level, the words of Hebrew express the very essence of what they describe, while the words of other languages simply represent a consensus of the masses. The quotation continues, as a God-given language, the meanings of the world, words of Hebrew are divinely inherent, while the connection of words to their meaning in other languages is simply arbitrary, end of quote. Such statements echo a tradition spanning millennia. You can al already find this kind of development in Philo uh, in the first century, <clears throat> that they are no longer accepted among specialists today. In the present lecture, I will try to show nevertheless that Hebrew may reasonably be considered a holy tongue. Although originally, although originally a human language, an ordinary human language, it became over time a sacred idiom, fit for religious purposes and ever so slightly unfit for everything else. So my first point is the sacralization of Hebrew. As the Bible itself remembers, <clears throat> Hebrew was not the language of the patriarchs, who were Arameans from Mesopotamia or further afield. Hebrew was, according to the Bible, the language of Canaan, a local northwest Semitic dialect spoken in the land long before there is any mention of a people of Israel. Classical Hebrew, such as it is attested in the older books of the Bible, is very similar to Moabite, a Transjordanian language, and close to, to Phoenician along the coast. If the Israelites, or some of them, came to Canaan from elsewhere, a notion for which there is very little hard evidence, <clears throat> but which is affirmed throughout the Hebrew Bible, if the Israelites came to Canaan from elsewhere, they must have adopted the language from the local population after their arrival. As we saw, this was already held by Nachmanides. Similar cases of language shift have been observed elsewhere. When populations migrate, the newcomers, after one or two generations, adopt the local language. There are many parallels of this in our world today, but I will give a biblical example. <clears throat> the Philistines, who most pro probably spoke some ancient Indo-European dialect related to Greek, right? the Philistines are Greek, coming from the Greek Isles and settling in the, the Gaza Strip, what's today the Gaza Strip. They spoke some kind of Greek, but soon enough, they adopt, adopted a Canaanite dialect very close to Hebrew and Phoenician. We have a handful of inscriptions of Philistines, and they are in some form of Hebrew. But they switched to the local language. The presence of a group, of Is, of a group called Israel in Canaan at the end of the 13th century before the Common Era is confirmed by the Bernepta Stili. The pharaoh tells about a campaign he did in Canaan, and he found some Israelites there. 
And this presence shows up in the archaeological record too. From a loose association of villages and regions, Israel turns into a more centralized entity. And by the end of the 10th century, uh, before the common era still, two kingdoms, Israel and Judah, emerge. Ancient Hebrew is spoken throughout the ter territory of both, although in different dialects. With the constitution of states, the possibili possibility of producing national religious literature is created. At the royal court, scribes would record archives, prophecies, old songs, and collect collections of ancestral traditions. It is probably to this period, let's say from the 10th century onwards, that the earliest, it is probably to this period that the earliest biblical texts go back. What has come down to us in the Bible is written mostly in the Judahite dialect. The Northern Kingdom, as you know, was incorporated into the Assyrian Empire after 722 before the Common Era, and a large part of its population, including all those who could read and write, were exiled to faraway countries. Any northern texts or traditions preserved in the Hebrew Bible would have been transmitted via Judahite scribes. And Gary Rensberg, who is here uh, this evening with us, is a great specialist of these northern traditions in the Hebrew Bible. A watershed occurred following the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple in 587 uh, before the Common Era. I hope you don't mind these historical uh, landmarks. They are very important. I always tell my students, you should remember three dates. Right? I'm sure you all know this, but just uh, uh, a thousand before Christ, that's uh, David, right? the beginning of the kingdom. Everything that's before David is before a thousand. Then the, the fall of Samaria, 70, 722. And then the fall of the Jerusalem temple, 587. Right. If you have those dates, all the rest is organized around it. So 587 <clears throat> is a very important date. The fall of the Jerusalem temple, the exile of, the Jude, of, the, of Judah to, uh, to Babylon. Up to that point, Hebrew is a national language. After it, Hebrew slowly turns into the language of an ethnic, ethno-religious group. The exiles were few in number, their ties with the homeland were limited, and the pressure to assimilate to their new surroundings was very strong. In these circumstances, there would have been every reason for the Judahite exiles to adopt another language, Aramean, Aramaic, the lingua franca, as their language, at least in writing. This is not what happened. Hebrew carried on and was kept alive, not only in writing, but also, as it seems, in day-to-day -day speech. As a result, the language thrived throughout the Babylonian, so the 6th century, the Persian, the Hellenistic, and the Roman periods, at least to the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132-135 of the Common Era. Most of the late biblical books, this is the Persian period, the Book of Bensira in the Hellenistic period, 90% of the Dead Sea Scrolls from the Roman period, and most of the early, earliest rabbinic literature also from the Roman period, are written in a rich and vigorous Hebrew. There is some Aramaic, but there is a lot of Hebrew. Hebrew is a, a living language. Hebrew thrives. Yet something happened to it along the way. Subtle changes in the meaning of words and subtle changes in the use of grammatical constructions altered its nature. Some Hebraists refer to a golden period of Hebrew literature before the exile and a silver period after the Judean exile. But this aesthetic judgment does not touch on the essence of the, of the process. It would be more correct to say that the social function of Hebrew ch undergoes a change. Existing alongside other languages, notably Aramaic, Hebrew adapted to its own particular niche in the life of its speakers. So what was this niche? It was this religious ethnic use, right, that I wanted to speak about. But let's look first at what changes. A phenomenon illustrating the change are words with a general meaning that come to be used exclusively to designate specific religious items or concepts. An illustration of this process 
can be found in a Hebrew word you all know. Uh, I'm sure there are many Hebrew scholars here, but even if you are not a Hebrew scholar, you know the word Torah. In most, Torah is a Hebrew word. In most of the biblical books, Torah simply means teaching or direction. In Proverbs 1, verse 8, the teaching, Torah, of a mother is evoked alongside the instruction of a father. This is not mothers teaching Torah to their children. It's uh, mothers teaching table manners to their children, right? The Torah of the mother is, you know, what, what uh, mothers who are here know. They, they teach their children, right? Uh, um, Torah is instruction. It's um, direction in life. In Leviticus, the term is frequently used to designate technical instruction on sacrifices and ritual acts. In Deuteronomy, this Torah designates the collection of legal instructions contained in the book. In the late books of the Bible, however, Torah takes on a different meaning. It now refers to the book in which Jewish law is written down. I quote from Nehemiah 8, verse 4, they discovered written in the law, in Torah, that the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites should live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. The mean, this meaning of Torah is practically identical with the one that is still common today. From a general purpose word, Torah changed into a religious term. Now, semantic specialization is a very common development in all languages, and the one example of Torah would mean uh, little if it were isolated. But there are many other examples. Everyday, everyday words are taken out of general use and restricted to a particular religious meaning. The word mincha, gift or tribute, takes on the special meaning of offering, sacrifice. The word moed, moment, appointed time, turns into a designation of the Israelite festivals. And the adverb tamid, which means always, comes to designate the daily offering in the Jerusalem temple. Hatamid, literally the always, uh, meaning the daily sacrifice. For all these words, and there are several more, the more general meaning is common in biblical books up to the Babylonian exile, while the special religious meaning is found particularly in books of the post-exilic era. Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel. Words taken out of general use because they were given a religious meaning are often replaced with uh, new, modern, uh, everyday words. For instance, the word mo'ed, appointed time, when it shifts to the meaning festival, is replaced with the Aramaic word zaman, appointed time. In the famous text, for everything there is a time, right? La kol zaman, for everything there is a, it's a new word. It's not the biblical or the classical word mo'ed. The process we observed in the late biblical books continues into post-biblical Hebrew. In the Hebrew of the sectarian Dead Sea Scrolls, several additional examples can be found. Ma'asim, deeds, takes on the meaning of observance of divine precepts. Arayot, nakednesses, comes to designate laws on incest. Gear, immigrant, turns into a technical term for proselyte. And Shemitah, re remission, release, takes on the meaning sabbatical year. Each of these words de deserves a close study. Yet taken together, they definitely illustrate a tendency in the history of the Hebrew language during the Persian and Hellenistic periods. Words with a general meaning over time receive a special religious meaning, which in many cases, though not always, comes to represent the only meaning of the word. One might say that these words are transferred from the profane sphere to the sacred. They are devoted to a particular religious use. The process may be described as a type of sacralization of language. Of course, only a tiny portion of the language is affected in this way. Hebrew continues to be used in many non-religious contexts. But what counts is not the quantity of words concerned, but the direction of the change. Two additional remarks uh, on these words. First, it is to be noted that the linguistic status of these words also changes. Also changes. We move from vocabulary to terminology, if this makes sense. Uh, 
in a way, a word like Torah really does represent Torah when it refers to the Torah, right? To the, to the Pentateuch, let's say, to the five books of Moses. A word like Torah really does represent a word intrinsically reflecting its meaning, as we said before, right? Its meaning is not flexible. It has a single referent. Secondly, it is worth noting that all the words discussed in this section point back to items or concepts defined in scripture. This goes without saying for Torah, which designates a written corpus as such, but all the others too share this characteristic. Moadim are religious festivals prescribed in Torah. Mincha and Tamid are sacrifice ordained in the Torah. Arayot are degrees of intermarriage forbidden according to Leviticus 18 and 20. And Shemitah is the sabbatical year as, def as defined in Deuteronomy 15. This scriptural quality of the Hebrew language in this second period characterizes a much more peculiar linguistic feature to which we turn presently. So that's my second point, reuse of scriptural phases, of phrases, I'm sorry, reuse of scriptural phrases. As stated, Ju Judahite exiles continue to use Hebrew during and after the Babylonian exile. What motivated them to do so? In Babylonia, they must have used Babylonian to communicate with their neighbors, and as is now attested by a newly discovered archive from this pre pre precise period, two or three years ago, five years ago, I don't know, a big cache of documents written in Babylonian in cuneiform, but authored by Jews, uh, were discovered in uh, Babylonian locations, and they show that Jews made contracts with their neighbors uh, in, in Babylonian. Whether they were written by, by Jews is not certain. They may have been written by Babylonian draftsmen, but they, they, are, they express the contracts uh, to which the Jews uh, subscribe. For everything having to do with international affairs and administration, they would have used Aramaic, as was certainly the norm from the Persian period onward. From all we know, these Judaites blended in perfectly in their new surroundings. Nevertheless, it appears that alongside Babylonian and Aramaic, the Judaite community uh, in exile upheld the tradition of speaking and writing in Hebrew. Among the first generation of exiles, this stands to reason, of course, and perhaps among the second generation, it remains understandable. But Hebrew continued uh, to be used for much longer. When the exiles returned to the homeland, in small numbers at first, at the end of the sixth century, after 70 years, according to Jeremiah, and more massively from the second half of the fifth century onwards, that's almost 150 years after they went away, when they returned, they brought back their Hebrew with them. It is true that the land was not empty during the exilic period, lower social strata remained there, but the Jews of the return did not decide to speak Hebrew for the sake of those who had remained in the land. From the accounts in Ezra and Nehemiah, it appears rather that there were many conflicts between those who returned and those who never left. So why did they continue for all these years, centuries, to, continue to speak Hebrew if there was every reason not to? A different explanation is needed. If Hebrew was kept alive among Jews in the diaspora and in the community later around the rebuilt, rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, the reason must have been, at least partly, of a religious nature. Exilic and post-exilic prophets continue to prophesy in Hebrew because they linked up with a pre-exilic prophetic tradition. Edifying stories like those of Jonah or Esther were told in Hebrew because they mirrored earlier stories in that language. Much literary creativity of this period was invested in adding to existing Hebrew, Hebrew texts. The book of Isaiah and the book of Jeremiah are excellent examples, each in its own way, of such fortschreibung. It's a German word meaning the continued elaboration of earlier books. Of course, you continue writing a book in the same language as, as it's written in. <laughs> But it was not just a matter of writing books. Hebrew was used in speech as well. It changed under the influence of other languages. We see that in the book of Ezekiel, where there are many Babylonian loanwords, 
Ezra and Nehemiah, Chronicles, many Aramaic loan words, and also throughout the late books, quite a number of um, words borrowed from Persian. The evidence comes from written texts, of course, but it strongly suggests that Hebrew was spoken. The massive impact of foreign language testifies to a situation of languages in contact. Right? Lang languages bleed into one another in a spoken situation, not when you're writing. And so this shows that Hebrew was a spoken language in all this period. So why did they write and speak in Hebrew over this long period in exile? The exilic community continued to use Hebrew down the generations because they defined their identity in light of texts to which they attributed religious authority. The Hebrew Bible did not exist as such at this period, but some form of proto-biblical texts, parts of what we have in the Pentateuch, parts of Samuel Kings, parts of the latter prophets, all composed before the exile, started playing a scriptural role. So there is some form of Bible, some form of scripture. In a very real sense, the exilic period sees the origin of a book religion. The Judaites in Babylonia define themselves as an ethnic religious group in light of a set of written texts. This is why they continue speaking the language of these texts among themselves. This is a highly peculiar relation of a human group to the language they speak. This is something I think that is unparalleled. The situation of an ethnic group, <clears throat> this uh, relation of an ethnic group to the language they speak accounts for another phenomenon in history to which I will now turn. In the late books of the Hebrew Bible, one finds a number of expressions that ostensibly continue earlier usage, yet differ from it in curious ways. Let us look at an example. The Pentateuch and the older historical books use the idiomatic expression to fill so-and-so's hands in the meaning to ordain so-and-so to a priestly office. I quote from Exodus 29, verse 9, The priest's office shall belong to Aaron and to his sons by a perpetual statute, and you, Moses, shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. The Hebrew says, You, Moses, shall fill the hand of Aaron and the hand of his sons. To fill the hands is to consecrate to the priesthood. In Chronicles, a post-exilic book, the same expression is used in a different meaning. In 1 Chronicles 29, verse 5, King David appeals to his people to give gold, silver, and precious stones for the building of the temple. After having enumerated all he is willing to donate himself, he goes on to say, Who then will offer willingly, filling their hands today to the Lord? Here the expression does not imply ordination to a priestly office, but gen generosity. How did the expression come to change its meaning? A likely explanation is that the group that produced Chronicles found the expression to fill so-and-so's hand in ancient texts, let's say in the book of Exodus or in the book of Kings, but failed to understand it correctly. They didn't know what it meant. It was already old Hebrew. They took the expression literally, so to speak, estimating that one fills one's hands with things to give. They then proceeded to use the ancient expression in their own writing with the new meaning they themselves had given to it. Reuse or resignification of classical expressions is found also in other languages. In English, the phrase a sea change is taken from Shakespeare's play The Tempest. But I'm not sure how many English speakers today realize that it comes from Shakespeare nor uh, that they know what it meant in its original context. In Shakespeare, it's about somebody who has changed because he's been lying in the sea for a long time. Right? So they changed him. Yes. Uh, but in English today, a sea change is used in a very different way. Right? Uh, what happens in the Bible is a little different, uh, all the same. The authors of Chronicles probably knew full well that to fill so-and-so's hand occurred in the Book of Kings, and they knew, although wrongly, as it turns out, what it meant. They thought they knew what it meant. Their use of the expression was designed to give their own writing an aura of antiquity and authenticity. 
The single example means little, but there are several other words and expressions in Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther uh, that attest the same phenomenon. Some of the grammar, too, of the late biblical books follows that of earlier texts, but illustrates unfamiliarity with the precise nuance it originally expressed. Let us expect, inspect another example. In classical Hebrew, <clears throat> let's say of the Pentateuch and the early historical books, an ending a, <clears throat> an ending a could be attached to the imperative to signify movement towards the speaker. Lech, you know, lech means go away, right? In Hebrew, in the Bible too, lech means go away or go from A to B. But lecha, with this a ending, means come here. Uh, in later stages of the language, this ending fell into disuse. This a ending with the imperative is late, in the, is uh, rare in the late biblical books and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it is missing in rabbinic Hebrew. Its meaning too was forget, forgotten early on, and we discovered only some 20 years ago by uh, Professor Steve Fassberg of the Hebrew University. In the latest book of the books of the Hebrew Bible, notably in Nehemiah. The form is used a number of times, uh, as stated, but it is not used correctly. It doesn't mean movement towards the speaker. The form was taken over because it sounded ancient. They found it in the old text, but its function was for forgotten. The A ending has now become a mere embellishment. The reuse of archaic forms of language has been described in terms of pseudo-classicism. A classical expression is used in later writings in a way that indicates it was lifted from the earlier text and revivified on the basis of exegesis, not of natural language use. The pseudo-classical understanding of words is often uh, attested independently in the ancient versions or later exegetical literature. This shows that the procedure did not happen ad hoc at the initiative of a single late author, but was part of a more general interpretive knowledge disseminated in Jewish circles during the post-exilic period. Pseudo-classicisms increase exponentially in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Out of many examples, I will again present only one. Ancient Hebrew has a word uh, shachat, derived from a root shacha, meaning to be de deep, which means a pit. Shachat is a pit, a literal one, like in the proverb, whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, or as a figure of the grave. This word is not attested in the latest books of the Bible, but it does re-emerge in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where it is found almost 50 times. It was a favorite word. Many of the occurrences can be interpreted on the supposition that shachat has the same meaning as in the Bible, and it's often translated like that. The adversaries of the sect are called men of the pit, if you've read the Dead Sea Scrolls in English translation, you have seen this, right? Men of the pit, it, it recurs very often. There are, however, some expressions that make this meaning unlikely, such as waves of shachat, right? Waves of the pit, it's not so good. Uh, and arrows of shachat, arrows of the pit. Some of the most perceptive commentators on the scrolls have argued, therefore, that shachat in the Dead Sea Scrolls does not mean pit, but destruction, a meaning derived from a different Hebrew root, right? Le shachet is to destroy. The word shachat is classical, but its use in the meaning destruction is pseudo-classical. There are many other examples in the Qumran text. The phenomenon of pseudo-classicism is a revealing one. It shows that to Jews of the late Persian and Hellenistic periods, classical Hebrew was not a dead language, the language of the Pentateuch, let's say was not a dead language to be deciphered respectfully, but the living language to be exploited as much as possible. Living in the diaspora or in occupied territory, they considered scripture their real home country. They considered scripture their real home country and its language their native idiom. They didn't speak the language of a land. They spoke the language of a book. And so they used this language, even if they didn't understand it correctly. This is the point, I suggest, where a normal human language turns into something else. If scripture is regarded as divine, and if its language is adopted as a means of communication in preference to all other languages, then this new language 
deserves to be regarded as a sacred idiom, as a holy tongue. Pseudo-classicisms are found throughout the later history of Hebrew until today. I must limit myself to one final example. In modern Hebrew, the word for dwarf, right, a small person, is, as you probably know, gamad. This usage is based on a passage in Ezekiel where a people named Gamadim, the Gamadites, is listed as one of many nations trading with Tyre. In later times, this nation was forgotten. You don't know who the Gamadites are, and I don't know, and even Gary Rensberg, who is here, doesn't know. <laughs> they are forgotten from the pages of history. In later times, this nation was forgotten, and the name was derived from the noun gomed. No, gomed means a short cubit, from here to here. Right? The long cubit is from here to here, and the short cubit is a gomed. So if they were that big, you know, they were only small. <laughs> the interpretation is found first in Jerome's Vulgate. Jerome was translating from the Hebrew, and he translates gamadim as pygmei, Pygmies, from the Greek pygmaioi, people of the length of a cubit. The interpretation is very old. It's already found in the fourth century. But the active use of the word gamad in the meaning dwarf is attested for the first time in 1788 in a writing of the Jewish Haskalah. A Jewish encyclopedia writer had to refer to uh, dwarves, and he didn't know the Hebrew word. So he took this one. He said, yeah. That's, that's the meaning it, that's been given to it. And today in Hebrew, you call dwarves gamadim. The process of pseudo-classical derivation characterizes the history of Hebrew over the entire peri uh, post-biblical period until today. The time has come to conclude this lecture. I have argued that Hebrew changed within the biblical period, turning from an ordinary language into something different, a holy tongue orienting its users towards a history of divine intervention as related in scripture. The consecration of everyday words to a religious meaning is one indication of the change. The phenomenon of pseudo-classicism is another. The change accounts for the extraordinary vitality of Hebrew. Hebrew continued in daily life until the second century CE, the Bar Kokhba War, I already uh, mentioned this, after that, it ceases as a spoken language, but Hebrew never dies out. All through the Talmudic period, through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, new literature is created in Hebrew. Halachic discussions, liturgical poetry, exegetical writings, but also writings on grammar, on philosophy, on medicine, etc. I, very quickly, I know my time is up, but very quickly two more illustrations. Uh, of this vitality of Hebrew. One is the exposition that some of you uh, visited or, and others may visit later, the exposition, Treasures from the Library of Corpus Christi College, where there are these um, uh, medieval manuscripts illustrating the encounter between the Christian world and, and Jewish learning. Medieval manuscripts in, in Hebrew showing that in the 13th century, people were producing new uh, texts in, uh, in Hebrew. And the second uh, illustration is a course I taught uh, in uh, Oxford for a few, um, uh, several times uh, with my colleague uh, Adriana Jacobs. I'm, she told me she, she might show up, but I'm, I haven't seen her. No, she's not there. Uh, Adriana J Jacobs, who lives in, in New York, uh, and another colleague who's called Joanna Weinberg, where we took uh, Hebrew literature from the beginning to the end. Right, from uh, Adriana is a specialist of uh, modern Hebrew poetry. Joanna does rabbinic Hebrew, and I'm a biblical scholar, so we took a biblical story, like let's say the uh, wife of Potiphar tries to seduce uh, Joseph, and then how do the rabbis explain this in the Middle Ages, and how does this resonate, how does this story resonate in modern Hebrew uh, poetry? It was a very interesting course, and it shows that Hebrew literature is a, is a unit, right? From, thousand before uh, the common era until today. Hebrew, as it has evolved, is not the language of a specific country, but the language of a book and the language of a people living by the book. Over the last century or so, Hebrew has 
again become a spoken day-to-day -day language. To its speakers, Hebrew is simply their native language, yet the words they use have a hidden face. This was true in antiquity, and it is true today. To speakers of Hebrew, the simple mention of today in Israel, the simple mention of dwarves or any number of other nouns and verbs may, under the right circumstances, trigger a reminiscence of a, Hebrew, of a biblical passage. I would like to end by quoting a passage from uh, the German Jewish philosopher uh, Franz Rosenzweig. In the preface to a translation of Hebrew poems by Yehuda Halevi, uh, Rosenzweig comments on the difficulty of rendering biblical allusions. When you translate the poetry into German, um, how, what do you do with biblical allusions? This gives him an occasion to slip in an unrelated insight. I translate his difficult German into English. It's a long quote, but listen to it. All Jewish poetry in the diaspora indexes its condition of being in, ex in exile. It's a philosopher. All Jewish poetry in the diaspora indexes its condition of being in exile. Ignoring this condition would mean to record the wor world in immediate fashion, as does other poetry. But the world surrounding this poetry is one of exile. And it must retain this character. If poetry in the diaspora were to abandon its posture and take in the surrounding world unmediated, the surrounding world would become its home and thus would cease to be exile. The exiling of the surrounding world is accomplished by means of the constant presence of scriptural language. I'll read this sentence again. My whole lecture is in this one sentence. <laughs> The exiling of the surrounding world is accomplished by means of the constant presence of scriptural language, these biblical allusions. With this language, a different re reality displaces that of the surrounding world and demotes the latter to the status of an illusion. In this perspective, a quotation is by no means a decorative appendage, rather it is the warp to the woof of speech. Rosenzweig speaks here of literary techniques and not of language per se, yet the idea he expresses is close to what I have argued in this lecture, writing in Hebrew in the sixth, sixth century before the Common Era, in the Middle Ages, or today, impli implies a form of expatriation in which the fictional world of scripture becomes more real than the real world. A language that accomplishes this deserves being called a holy tongue. Thank you very much, Jan, for that uh, very um, enlightening and illuminating uh, lecture. And we'll have time for uh, Q&A, but I've been given the task of um, engaging with Jan for a few moments before we move to uh, the audience participation of the program. Um, it's just, uh, you know, as I was sitting here listening to you, it's a staggering narrative, it really is. Um, I, I want to take us to um, where you took us to Ezekiel and Second Isaiah living in the exile in sixth century uh, Babylonia. Um, in the case of Ezekiel, direct exile from Jerusalem, and in the case of Second Isaiah, responsible for the end of the book of Isaiah of, of a generation or two later. Um, did they have the biblical text in written form? Did the Jews leave Jerusalem and take scrolls? Do you envision it all in their minds that they just have their the biblical text in their hard drive? Did they have personal hard drives? Did they have physical scrolls with them? Would you comment upon that? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this question, which is uh, an important one in, in biblical studies today. And many of my colleagues, especially in continental Europe, would say that they didn't, right? They wrote everything later. Uh, I think it's quite plausible that they took uh, scrolls with them when they went into a, uh, to exile, if these stories and traditions were um, dear to them, they, they would have taken them. And they were the elite, right? The people who were, went into exile were the elite. So they were the writing and reading um, class. And, um, and they were the ones who would be attached to these, uh, to these writings. 
I think what clinches it is that the, the prophets that you mentioned, Ezekiel and uh, Second Isaiah, uh, although they rarely quote uh, scripture, they allude to it all the time. Um, ben, ben Sommer's book on uh, Second Isaiah, I think, is very clear in uh, in showing that even the later strata of the t of the Torah were known to this uh, to this poet, uh, almost in the form in which we have it. Right, uh, allusions to Genesis one, very precise, and uh, and other uh, uh, texts that are not among the oldest uh, of the of the Pentateuch, and uh, in Ezekiel also, you have a lot of. Uh, interaction, I would say, especially with, Le with Leviticus. Um, uh, so um, we don't know, of course. No, but we weren't there. But it, uh, I think there is no other way to explain what we see in the pages of the Bible than to say that, that there was some form of, not the Bible, of course, but uh, some form of uh, emerging scripture uh, did play a role for them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to proceed chronologically. Uh, we're starting in the 6th century, and I'll just move a century later. We're now in the 5th century, and we're um, really in the heart of what we call the Persian period. In the land of Israel, all Jews in the world, in fact, were living in the Persian Empire during the 5th century. Um, from the land of Israel, we have the biblical material. You mentioned um, Ezra and Nehemiah, and a little bit later, Chronicles and so on. Where are the archaeological finds? We have really no Hebrew. We have plenty of Hebrew from uh, archaeological sites before 587 at places like Arad and Lachish and a little bit earlier than that, Samaria and so on. Uh, but we don't have the material. Do you, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yes, uh, thank you. It's a dark hole for us. It's a dark hole. Black hole. Yeah. But this doesn't uh, pertain only to Hebrew, as, as, as you know, right? Uh, the, there are almost no uh, epigraphic texts uh, for the whole uh, Persian period uh, at all. There, there are no more. We have uh, a large archive of our Aramaic texts from Elephantini in Egypt. There was a, a group of uh, Jews who wrote letters uh, to Jerusalem in, in uh, Aramaic. Uh, but uh, in the land of Israel, we have neither Hebrew nor Aramaic nor Persian nor, nor anything else. So it is really a, a black hole which I think illustrates the fact that, the, that there, were many, there were few uh, Jews in Jerusalem and that this was really a dark period in a, in a certain sense. Uh, it, you know, my, my German friends think that, think that the whole uh, Hebrew Bible was written in this period, but that means that almost everybody would have been writing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't think that's right. I, I think uh, many texts were produced before the exile when you know, there were scribes and there was a king who could uh, tax uh, his countrymen you know, to, to pay those scribes. I want to take us to the other end of the uh, Jewish exile. Um, the most well-known, of course, is the exile to Babylonia in the 6th century, and that community continues. We get so much material from, for example, Ezra and Nehemiah, who returned in the 5th century back to the land of Israel. But there was a large migration of Jews to Egypt as well, uh, Book of Jeremiah refers to this in particular, and it would only make geographical sense if the Babylonians were attacking in one direction and you didn't want to fight or withstand them, you would flee in the other direction, which of course would take you to Egypt. Uh, we know very little about that Jewish community during those centuries until we get to the third century, and I want to just applaud another aspect of Jan's scholarly work, which has uh, not been mentioned up until now, and that is he's also one of the leading scholars in the world of the Septuagint. Uh, the translation made by the Jews of, of Egypt, Alexandria, uh, in the middle of the third century of the Torah, and then eventually the later books done under the patronage of uh, King Ptolemy II. So I want to take us to that uh, community. Uh, Jan didn't mention uh, this, this at all today. Uh, to what extent, and you've written on this, and I want to just invite you to, say, to share your knowledge of this with the audience, to what extent did the translators know Hebrew? Obviously, they must have known Hebrew to translate the book into Greek, the Torah into Greek. And who were they? Uh, were they locals? Did they come from Jerusalem? There's all the theories are floating out there. And this is a, a key issue in the history of the Hebrew language. I wanted you to just say a few words about that. Yes, thank you. That's really a wonderful question. <laughs> Um, so, in, in two words, I, I would say that um, uh, the translators of the Pentateuch were uh, Jews of the diaspora. They were uh, 
in Egypt. They use um, many Aramaic words, which don't maybe prove a lot, but they use some uh, Egyptian words too, uh, like um, uh, oifi, uh, which is a weight or a measure, and uh, achi, which is the grass that uh, grows along. They are Egyptian words. We, we know from the Egyptian, well, you, you know better than I that they are tested in, in Egyptian. Um, and so they, they were uh, Jews who had been living in, uh, in Egypt for a long time, and they wrote for the local community. So uh, to my mind, this means that there were some learned people who still know, knew uh, quite a bit of Hebrew, enough to translate the, the Torah, as you say. Um, but uh, the, the knowledge, the actual knowledge of the Holy Tongue was uh, receding. And so they, they thought, well, either we're going to stop being Jews or going to stop being uh, Torah-oriented Jews, or we have to translated it, translate the Torah into the local language. And so this was a very momentous uh, decision, um, which is different from the option taken in other branches of, of Judaism, right? I think in, in the Babylonian exile, they didn't uh, abandon Hebrew. They didn't translate the Torah into Aramaic and then uh, get rid of the Hebrew, right? Uh, so in, in the Western diaspora, there is a different attitude. Um, the knowledge of Hebrew is good, but it's not excellent. Uh, there are, uh, when you, often the everyday words like bo and halach, right, uh, to go and to come, they, they get right. But when, when there are rare words, often you can see that the translators of the Septuagint are actually guessing. They, right. Uh, they get it from the context. Uh, I, yes, I don't want to denigrate their work, but uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a very good translation. Uh, uh, we don't want to denigrate. I could say more about it, but uh, <laughs> no, we, yeah. we don't want to denigrate the work of the great translators of the of the um, of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Torah, uh, which has actually emerged again due, due to Jan and, and other scholars as, an, as a whole new field of of, of, of uh, great importance in the field of Jewish studies, especially with an increased awareness of the uh, uh, lots of archaeological information and. Uh, papyri and so on forthcoming from that wonderful dry climate of Egypt which has preserved everything for us. Uh, let's move, staying with a little slightly later now, as I said, proceeding somewhat chronologically. The Maccabean Revolt, uh, the middle of the second century. Um, we have a colleague at UCLA, Bill Schneiderwind, who has argued, um, actually a colleague of David Myers, uh, who's argued that um, there was a revival in Hebrew uh, consciousness, language consciousness. Uh, we have these coins and, and uh, the using the old script. You want to say something? About, how do you engage with this material? How would you teach this? Um, yes, uh, thank you. So uh, what I try to describe in the lecture is this attachment to Hebrew. Uh, let's say uh, the biblical language is the, is the national language, right? So they, they try to keep it alive, to develop it, to use it, and to exploit it. Uh, but this uh, process is maybe not entirely linear, right? It, there could be ups and downs and pe periods when it was easier to do this and periods when it was uh, more difficult. And so I, I think it, it stands to reason that in the Maccabean period, when they were, again, a nation state, they would also uh, have a heightened interest in, in Hebrew and, and try to say new things uh, uh, I know the, the first book of Maccabees is uh, transmitted in, in Greek, but it was originally written in uh, Hebrew. And uh, so this was sort of the, the, the history of, of their movement, right? So uh, I think um, the theory is, is a good one to say that uh, there was a, a sort of renaissance, right? But this doesn't mean that, that it was new. Uh, I think the, the initial decision to continue Hebrew was taken in the in the sixth century, and then it went through many phases uh, later. And when I, when I began and I said something about the breathtaking narrative, um, it, it really is phenomenal that a community in diaspora and return and just you know continue to really hold on to that Hebrew language. And uh, that's certainly the takeaway point that I take from uh, this evening. So with that, I think we'll just ask uh, Chris, I think you're gonna be uh, fielding the Q and A and Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I have a Orthodox friend who is a, who is a, who is a, who is a Greek Orthodox, and the point about Septuagint that, according to Talmud, there were seventy-two scribes, 
and they and they all translate this famous word Alma from Hosea as the Parthenos. I speak Parthenos. I speak uh, I speak uh, I speak Greek. Parthenos means uh, virgin. So, do you have a real extant copy of this Torah from from which they translated uh, Parthenos? You, if, if, if you say this, this, this word is Alma, how do you know this, that this was Alma at three centuries before common era? Because the oldest uh, uh, copy of Torah we have, I think it's the Aleppo, Aleppo Codex, which is from seventh century. So how can you prove that this word was Alma and not, for example, Betula or, or any other word? If you don't have this copy, and Talmud says that 72 scribes and they all uh, translated the same text. Yes, thank you. So you're referring to the book of Isaiah, not to, to the Torah, right? Uh, the, the word Alma, Alma is translated as Parthenos in, in the famous text in, uh, in uh, Isaiah 7, which was then taken by Christians as being a prediction of, uh, of Christ. Uh, so, but the question is an important one. Um, we uh, very often our Greek evidence for the Bible is older than the Hebrew evidence, right? We we have uh, Greek um, Greek fragments of doc of the Deuteronomy that are from 200 um, b before Christ, and we don't have any Deut uh, Hebrew, or we didn't have before the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? So this would be part of my answer that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are much much earlier than the the complete manuscripts that we that you refer to, right? We we used to have complete manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible from uh, around a thousand uh, in the common era, right? Um, but with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we go back uh, 100, 1,200 years, uh, back to the third century before Christ, and and the, the Dead Sea Scrolls show, you know, they are partial; they are only fragmentary, but they show that the manuscripts we read from the Middle Ages are very faithful to the to the old text. So I think biblical scholars uh, don't see any reason to doubt that in Isaiah uh, 7, uh, the word was really Alma, and the reason why it was translated as Parthenos was had to do with the interpretation of the of the translator, right? He it's not an illegim illegitimate way, you know. Alma means a young woman, so usually young women in Israel were supposed to be uh, virgins. So uh, if she wasn't married, she should be a virgin, and so he, he translated it as virgin, uh, the, uh, virgin. You know the way you can translate. Uh, so sometimes when you translate, you you take some freedom, uh, some liberty with uh, with the original text. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, would you care to comment on the following? Um, it seems to me that you presented uh, from Rashi's perspective. You quoted a, a verse from uh, Genesis uh, in the Hebrews by Yikra Adam Shemot, uh, and uh, Adam called names to all living things. Tosafot, the, the collection, for example, known as Dots of Canaan, the book of Exodus, comments on this verse in Genesis and says that Adam named all living things in, in the 70 languages, not just in Hebrew. And there's, a, there, there's there are another collection of Tosafot that make similar comments on other verses. I've traced this, actually there is a, there is a debate about this among the rabbis. In, in um, the Talmud Yerushalmi, Tractate Megillah, first uh, chapter on the ninth halacha, the ninth Mishnah. And there are two schools of thought. One is the one that Rashi has taught many of us, you know, in our, from our elementary school education, and that Hebrew seems to be the formative language of the world. But there's another school of thought among the rabbis that the world itself was created in 70 languages and people spoke 70 languages and understood each other's language until the time of the Tower of Babel when they lost that ability to understand other than their native tongue. So my question is, does this refre reflect perhaps some type of universalism uh, as opposed to the particularism that some would, uh, would attribute to having a Hebrew be the primary uh, informative tongue of the world. Wonderful, v very nice. Uh, so uh, this shows that um, uh, exegesis of the Bible uh, 
can bring up all kinds of interpretations, right? Uh, and so I didn't know this interpretation of, uh, of the verse in, in Genesis. I thank you for pointing that out. Uh, and uh, I, I love it. I think it's really, really nice uh, that, uh, you know, when some rabbis say it's Hebrew, some others say, no, it wasn't necessarily Hebrew. It might have been all the languages. And, but they, of course, they are uh, struggling with the same question, right? Um, wh what is going on? And which language were they speaking? And what was the status of Hebrew and of the other languages? Uh, and, and this, uh, in, in our approach today, um, you know, we, we see this as, um, as playful uh, interpretation, but not as the real meaning of the text, right? Uh, languages change, right? Uh, it's not plausible that Adam would have given uh, the, the names of the animals in 17 languages because they would have changed through, through time. So the, the it's an atemporal approach, right? There are two different schools, but this, their starting point is the same, right? And, and they react to the same questions that, that uh, jump out of the text. But, but I thank you very much. I think in this case, the question is much more interesting than the answer. <laughs> <laughs> if I can be permitted just to chime in, and a good example of this, and Jan will love this one, but you know this already, is the um, biblical Hebrew word kishuim means cucumbers. Um, but eventually, uh, Hebrew took on the Greek word malafafon, and so in modern Hebrew, kishuim was used for squash. Right, so you have this kind of, this is vegetables, not, not animals, I realize, but um, it, this is exactly what happens. And uh, you know, Hebrew adopts the Greek word for cucumber and then uses the old word for cucumber for squash. It's just wonderful how these things happen in language. Uh, could you please comment on the phenomena of gematria in biblical Hebrew? And do you think, is it sheer coincidence and perhaps nonsense, or is it divine? Thank you. <laughs> if, if I have to choose between these two, I will say that it's uh, nonsense. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think, you know, I think the best practitioners of uh, gematria are people who are very attuned to a tradition, and they don't come up, you know, I, if somebody tells me the Bible predicts the name of Hitler, then I say this is sheer nonsense, right? I'm sure you can calculate it, but it's not, it's simply not true, it's not possible. But um, this is not true of all uses of gematria, right? There is a use of gematria that, that is uh, prolonging old insights that are part and parcel of the Jewish traditional exegesis. And then I say, okay, I would never venture to explain the Bible this way, but I accept the lesson. Is that a fair way of answering? So I'm, I'm not distributing the the floor, right? You have to uh, you have to try and catch uh, Chris's eye. Uh, there <coughs> There's a short narrative in the Masachet uh, Brachot, first uh, tractate of the Talmud, in which there's an argument. Uh, among the rabbis about whether you could say prayers in Hebrew or, or, or the language of the, of the place, your, your, your native language. And uh, the majority of rabbis uh, take the position that uh, you could say it in your native language because you can understand what you're saying when you're, when you're davening, when you're praying. And, but Yehuda Hadassi, who is the, the head of the rabbis at the time of this, this this argument of this dispute takes the position that you should say it in Hebrew. And he takes it very, very firmly in the Talmudic text. And I was wondering whether you could comment on what the uh, uh, dynamics might be with respect to the Hebrew language at the time of uh, this dispute, the yeah. beginning of the uh, third century, probably. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, so very nice. Uh, it's, it's a very nice passage, which I knew, but which I hadn't interpreted in this way, right? Because it's about the use of Greek, right? Uh, literally, they say, can you say? Yeah. No, I, I, like, I like the way you contextualize it. So I would say that Yehuda Hanasi, uh, he, uh, he is the champion of the approach that I try to illustrate in my lecture, right? Which is how Hebrew became a holy tongue. 
uh, his colleagues who say you should be open to other languages, they are more like the translators of the Septuagint, right? Who say, well, it's more important that people understand than that we keep the same language. Of course. Yeah. Yes, I think Yehuda Hanasi is is making himself the mouthpiece of of the of the official. There is no official uh, Jewish opinion, right? But I mean the, the the mainstream the mainstream Jewish opinion, which accounts for the way uh, Hebrew grew. Yeah. And I think in this period it was relevant, and it was relevant a hundred years later, and it was relevant a hundred years before that. It was relevant at every point in time after the first generation of exiles. Hebrew was always uh, uh, menaced by extinction because the Jews spoke many other languages, and there was no reason to keep to Hebrew except the Bible. I, I apologize for chiming in again, but I actually brought this passage thinking I might raise it this evening, but this is a great opportunity. The same Rabbi Yudah Hanasi is quoted in the Talmud Bavli, uh, the, uh, sort of questioning why Aramaic is used in the land of Israel. And he says, Lashon HaKodesh or Lashon Yevanit. You should use either Hebrew or Greek, which is quite remarkable, I guess. So you, even in the same rabbinic tradition, you have different views about what Reb, uh, Rabbi Yudah Hanasi's attitude towards the Hebrew language was. And it's really striking that he would think that Greek was up there with Hebrew as the language is to be used. Yeah. Should take one more question. We'll take one from the other side of the auditorium. Yes, could, could you explain and comment on the prophetic perfect tense as used in the Tanakh? <laughs> so, yes, I, I wrote, I, I, I'm sorry for bragging. I, I wrote a book on the on the verbal system in, in biblical Hebrew <laughs> of 450 f pages. So I, I, I know the answer to your question. <laughs> but I'm, 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 I'm afraid of boring the audience. <laughs> I, but in one word, I would say that the prophetic perfect, I think, exists, right? Because it's, it's contested. I think there are prophecies that where prophets say such and such a thing has already happened, but it hasn't happened. And I, th I, d I uh, explain it as a variant of the perfect of um, certainty. That when you, when you, when something is certain, you can, exp you can present it as something that is already done. Yeah. It's, I I yeah, in the past tense. Yes. It's, uh, it's. I think a stylistic usage, uh, as in English, right? You can say to somebody, "You're a dead man." <laughs> right. It doesn't mean that they are already, but you're, it's certain you're going to kill, I mean, right? In a, in, a, in a Western movie, right? You're a dead man. <laughs> right? You, you understand what I say, I'm saying? You can say something that's not literally true to make a, make a point. And I think it's called, um, hmm, that's a good <laughs> question. I think it's simply the biblical Hebrew verbal system, and it's an easy reach of my chair at all times. So. <laughs> Available it's at your local bookstore, no <laughs> doubt. Um, we could go on for a very long time, and uh, I'm going to beg your indulgence to go on for just a little bit longer, because I, I just have a question with which to conclude the evening, uh, which I think really gets at the richness of the Hebrew language as reflected through the prism of an unlikely source, which is German Jewish thought. You concluded by talking about Rosenzweig and his view of Hebrew as an, an, a kind of linguistic embodiment of exile. And I want to juxtapose that view of Hebrew, that, that view of Hebrew as expatriation, exile, to the view articulated by one of Rosenzweig's interlocutors uh, from the Weimar context in a text which you probably know, which is Gershom Scholem's famous letter to Rosenzweig on the occasion of Rosenzweig's 40th birthday, in which um, Scholem admonishes speakers of Hebrew in Palestine in the 20th century uh, from submitting to a kind of secularist mindset that ignores the extraordinary 
power and resonances of traditional Hebrew, which contained, as he famously referred to it, a, an apocalyptic thorn. And so we have these two, on one hand, Hebrew as exile, and on the other, Hebrew as a kind of terrifying act of normalization, emerging from the same cultural milieu. And it suggests, again, the extraordinary resonances of Hebrew and its capacity to be X and its opposite, it would seem. I wonder if you have a concluding reflection. Okay, thank you very much for mentioning this, uh, this uh, letter of uh, Gershom Scholem, which I, I do know very well. I think it illustrates two sides of, this, of the same coin, right? That uh, what, what Gershom Sholom is uh, upset about is the ba banalization, banalization of Hebrew, right? That if you start speaking it in all kinds of uh, secular context, you, um, you sort of uh, obs uh, obscure uh, this, this uh, traditional side, uh, but it shows that what, what he calls this ap apocalyptic storm means that it's always there, right? And it might jump on you at any moment. Uh, and so he's, he's, he's uh, warning uh, speakers of modern Hebrew, uh, know what you're doing, right? And so I think even uh, in French we say en creux, right? Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the absence of, of this extraordinary uh, force of Hebrew, uh, it's, it's there, right? Even, even when it's yeah. not there, yeah. it is there. Yeah. The Does it make sense? Right, absolutely, the presence of the absent. Um, I have to say, this is my first event at the Center for Jewish History, and if it's like this every night, um, we have a very long and promising future together. I would like to just explicitly name, since we've talked a lot about naming, um, our participants tonight, first of all, Professor Gary Rensberg for a really wonderful um, engagement with our speaker. <laughs> and Professor Jan Houston for not just a breathtaking narrative, but an absolutely spellbinding one uh, that captivated your audience for the entire night. And along with our friends from Corpus Christi and the University of Oxford, I now invite you to join us for a reception. Thank you very much.